What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. All right, moving on. I wanted to hit Oklahoma City, New Orleans. I, again, I didn't have time today just because of what happened last night. I, I just I had to hit the other three games this morning, and it just kind of got away from me in terms of time. So I wanted to hit Oklahoma City, New Orleans because we did hit game two of Miami, Boston, and we did hit game three of Orlando, um, uh, of Orlando, Cleveland, but we had not yet hit Oklahoma City, New Orleans since game one. We only hit game one. We didn't hit game two. So I wanted to get back to them. And uh, they go up 3-0. They blow out the Pelicans in New Orleans today. This th- this was a big test. I thought the Pels were going to give them some issues. If you guys remember in the series preview, I thought they had some matchup advantages that kind of played into their strengths. And like they did in game one. Game one, they, they, they hung around and gave a good fight. But like the Thunder have dominated this series since then. And they have passed that test with flying colors. And Oklahoma City's defense has been the story of that first-round matchup. They have a 94.7 defensive rating, which is the best among playoff teams so far in the first round. Again, that means they allow 94.7 points per 100 possessions. They're defending the three-point line really well. They're allowing just 9.4 three-pointers made per game from New Orleans, although New Orleans takes a lot of mid-range jump shots, so that's part of it from process standpoint. But they're doing a good job getting physical up on the ball and taking away easy threes. They're allowing uh, just 28% from three from New Orleans. Big one on the perimeter here is just like, and this is what's so exciting about the future of the of the Thunder. You know, we talk about Minnesota a lot. Minnesota, one of the big reasons why I've I like their their roster construct, and I've been talking about this for years with Minnesota. But it's like, it's Ant, it's Jaden, it's Rudy, and it's it's what I call a bracket. And the reason why I refer to it as a bracket is like in individual defense situations, you got a guy that's pressuring the ball. And then you have this guy that's waiting on the back line, right? So if he gets over a ball screen and my my on-ball defender is in pursuit from behind, he's back pressuring while Chet's waiting on the other end. And there is a certain... That bracket gets spread out when it's a lesser perimeter defender and a lesser rim protector, right? And there's just so much more that can be done in that space in between, not to mention the lack of rim protection entirely, can allow a guy to get to the rim consistently. But when you have a legitimate rim protector with length that not only can protect the rim, but can also bother shots and floater in mid-range, and you've got a real long defender that can pressure from behind and disrupt the base, that's that where that bracket can get terrifying defensively. And that's what makes you know the Jaden McDaniels, Anthony Edwards, Rudy Gobert trio so devastating, right? Well, Oklahoma City kind of has their own version of that. Now, it's a little different. It's uh, it's less based on length because Jaden McDaniels is more of a length-based defender. Lou Dort is more of like a fire hydrant, low center of gravity, beat you to spots, disrupt your base, make you shoot over the top kind of guy, right? And he's done just an unbelievable job on Brandon Ingram. Physical ball pressure, chasing him over the top of screens, beating him, literally beating him over the top of screens and cutting him off disrupting that base. Again, when you're going up against a pull-up shooter, think of it like this. If I'm CJ McCollum and I'm Brandon Ingram and I'm in the summertime, right? There, you're going through dribble combinations and footwork and you're, used, you're, you're kind of building a muscle memory based on a certain level of freedom of movement, right? And then you get when you get a really good on-ball defender who stays physically attached and messes with all of the the movement while you're getting to your spot and disrupts the base, suddenly the muscle memory at the end of that shot doesn't look the same as it does when you're in your shooting drills, right? And like b- with Dort on Brandon Ingram and Jalen Williams on CJ McCollum, and then they've got guys coming off the bench too, like Hassan Wallace and, and, uh, and Aaron Wiggins have both done a really good job. They just have disrupted the perimeter players that initiate everything for New Orleans. And now the one thing for New Orleans, obviously without Zion being in the game, it just changes everything, right? Like if Zion's in, Dort's probably guarding him. That moves Jalen Williams over to uh um to that moves Jalen Williams over to Brandon Ingram, which is probably going to put Shea on CJ, which is like a better matchup, right? And so like obviously Pelicans fans, I'm aware Zion being out is a is a significant, you know, factor here. But within the context of this perimeter battle that we're seeing in this series, the the Pelicans the, the Pelicans are just getting their ass kicked, and and, and that and that's a credit to those Thunder 
perimeter defenders. But again, the other side of that bracket is Chet. He had four blocks today. You got Trey Murphy driving closeouts twice when he tried to dunk on him and like cleanly blocked him on dunks twice. The first one, like Trey brought it back like this while he was flying down the lane. I honest to God don't know how Chet got to it without fouling him. It was an incredible defensive play. He got both CJ and BI in ball screens. And again, that's that bracket on the CJ one. It's like he finally he snakes the ball screen. It kind of gets over and and gets over to his left hand side and he just doesn't even see Chet coming and Chet just spikes it into the ground like a volleyball player, right? Like it's just it's another it's another layer of that defense that makes it difficult. They are forcing 19 turnovers per game in this series. That's the most among playoff teams. Remember, they led that category in the regular season as well. They're scoring 21 points per game off of turnovers as well. And then on the offensive end of the floor, like Shea, again, this is a lesser opponent. Uh, and we're going to get into that in a minute, but Shea has had no slowdown from the regular season, 28 points, five rebounds and six assists per game on 59% true shooting. So just a tiny dip in volume and efficiency, which again, the Pelicans have really good perimeter defenders. Give some credit to Herb Jones, right? And then Jalen Williams, his playoff debut has been awesome. 20.7 rebounds and five assists per game, 53% from the field and 42% from three. I am full. I'm, I, I've said this before. Like, I think Jalen's so damn good. I think he could be better than SGA one day. I've said this on the show before, but I look at him as like the, the best combination of playmaking, downhill force, and pull-up shooting that I've seen from a wing player in a very, very long time. And, and and I am not the least bit surprised that he is just completely kicking ass in the playoffs. There was a stretch in the second quarter today where the Pelicans put Jose Alvarado on him, and he just immediately bullied him twice, once on the post and once uh, once on the low post, once on the high post. And they just immediately had to pull him off and put Najee Marshall on him. He uh, hit a couple of these like crazy like hanging double pump shots in the in the second quarter, which just are an indicator of just how insane of an athlete. He is. And then Josh Giddy, like Josh Giddy had a really rough game one. And obviously all these teams around the league are going to be leaving him open uh, just to give them a better chance of containing elsewhere. And he's been great since struggling in game one. It, he's been hitting his spot up threes uh, more frequently, had a couple of nice transition pushes today. He had this one against CJ McCollum in the first half where he did this like nice behind the back dribble into a Euro step floater. He had 21 points today. Uh, I actually, we we do a, here at the the volume, we do like a little playoff points league. And Josh Giddy was one of the players I picked. Uh, one, because I thought the Thunder would win at least the first round. And then also like Josh Giddy is just a guy that's going to get opportunities. And he capitalized on those in a big way today. So I was a little concerned about that pick in game one, but Josh has been making me look good over the last couple of games. But now kind of zooming out a little bit, this is by far the easiest matchup in the West. That goes without saying, right? Like they're playing the eight seed without their best player. I was thinking about this earlier too. They're the only team in the West playoffs without a top 10 player. Like Oklahoma City has Shea, clearly a top 10 player. Denver is Jokic, clearly a top 10 player. Minnesota, Anthony Edwards. I think he might be a top 10 player now. We might just have, like, I, I, he's certainly playing at that level. I mean, whether he can sustain, we'll see, but he's playing at that level. The Clippers, Kawhi Leonard when he's healthy. Obviously, a top 10 player, he's out, so I guess, or he's uh, obviously unhealthy, so I guess you can kind of factor that in. But the Mavericks have Luka, that's a top 10 player. The Suns have Kevin Durant, that's a top 10 player. The Lakers have LeBron and Anthony Davis. I think both of them are top 10 players. So, like, no, <laughs> there's just so much talent in the league. We might have to zoom out and actually make a list and see who might get cut from that list. But the point is, is like, when you're talking about stars, like the Pelicans are the one team that just doesn't have that level of firepower, right? So, Obviously, you have to beat who's in front of you. You earned this matchup by getting the number one overall, uh, the number one seed in the Western Conference. So credit the Thunder for getting that done, right? But I am excited to see round two, and and I think they've passed the first round test with flying colors. Round two, whether it's Clippers or Mavs, that's going to be a really, really interesting and exciting series. Running into some real firepower, running into some real uh, like multiple high level shot creators that are. Every shot creator on both of those teams is better than CJ and Brandon. So it's just going to be an entirely different level uh, that they're going to be going up against. And then much better uh, front lines that they're going to have to deal with. Zubac is just a, a really, really uh, a much higher level center than a Jonas Valanciunas. Uh, even just even if you look at some of these small ball front lines that Dallas can throw out there, Daniel Gafford even brings some size to the table. So it's going to be a big challenge for them in round two, but they played really well in the first round. And again, I, the defensive end is where I've been most impressed by them. All right, guys, that is all I have for tonight. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. A uh, quick breakdown for tomorrow. Uh, the plan as of right now is we're going after Clippers Mavs, and uh, that that's just going to be uploaded to YouTube. That won't be live. 
And then Monday morning, we have the Nerd Sesh guys coming on the show, and we're going to bounce around the entire first round and go through and hear what Carson and Logan have to say about everything. Again, I appreciate you guys for rocking with me. I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>